Greetings, Sojourners, and welcome to the galaxy. Please keep your hands, tentacles, and other extremities inside the vehicle at all times. Remember, don't panic. I am the guide, and this is the galaxy. Welcome here to Crossroads Church. If you don't know who I am, my name is Matt Manning. I'm one of the uh, pastors here, and it's a privilege to be on the teaching team, the preaching team here at Crossroads Church, as today we continue our journey through this little book of 1 Peter, uh, where we are really going verse by verse uh, through this book, looking at the great truths uh, that God is giving to us and has given to us. If you're joining us online, welcome uh, online, wherever you may be on this snowy day here in Colorado. And then also, if you're new with us, man, Welcome uh, to Crossroads Church. You have landed right in the middle of our fall series where we are eight weeks in uh, to this series in 1 Peter. It's a book that is written by a guy, just a regular guy with regular faith who happened to be one of Jesus' best friends. That's who Peter is. And as we've traveled through these eight weeks together, what we have uh, really discovered is that this letter is an important letter to us in our time and in our day. Because when Peter sat down and wrote this letter, he wrote it to a group of churches that wasn't too dissimilar from our churches, from our church. And he was writing to a culture that was much, very much like our culture. A culture where Christianity was not the majority view, but rather was progressively being pushed uh, to the fringes. And for most of us, for most of us in most of our lives, uh, we have lived in a culture that has been really in line, in sync with our beliefs, our norms, and our values, haven't we? That from the very beginning of this nation's founding, what sociologists would call this nation is really a Christian nation, where where our beliefs and our values were in line with the culture's beliefs and values. That's the way that it's been. And yet over the last 30 years or so, there's been a shift in our culture, and there's been a divide that's begun to happen, where culture is no longer in sync with our beliefs, our values, and our norms. And this growing divide that's begun to happen over the last 30 years, sociologists now look at our nation and say, we're not a Christian nation anymore. We're actually living in an age of post-Christian, that we are a post-Christian culture. We are a post-Christian nation. And as that divide has, has widened, and as that gap has widened, it creates tension for us, doesn't it? It creates tension for us, those of us who are believers, who are trying to faithfully follow what Jesus has, has given us to follow. And there's moments in our lives that this tension is created. How do I live in a culture that doesn't hold the values and beliefs that I hold? How do I do that? What does that look like? And it's that tension that we've come to kind of face-to-face with every week during these eight weeks. And it's that tension is the reason that we remind you every week that First Peter, and this is point number one in your outline, that First Peter is our guide to living with hope, as sojourners living with hope in a post-Christian culture. That's the theme of 1 Peter. It's our guide to living with hope as sojourners in a post-Christian culture. That 1 Peter is all about the hope that we have as Christians grounded in the reality that this world, what we experience in this world, is not everything for us. That this world, in fact, as Peter puts it, is not even home for us. That it's grounded, our hope is grounded in that one day we will be with Jesus, that we will be at home with Jesus. And this hope that, that we're to live with, that Peter talks about throughout all of his letters, not this like wishy-washy, man, I hope that maybe one day this happens, but rather it's the present experience of a future delight. That's what Christian hope is. That Christian hope is, looks into the future, and as it looks into the future, and, and that time when ultimately we're at home with Jesus, and the joy and the happiness and the goodness of what that will be, and it pulls that delight into our present experience. That's what Christian hope is. It's the hope that's best probably seen in a bride as she approaches her wedding day. It's the kind of hope that I get in the morning when I know that I'm eating Chick-fil-A for lunch. All right? It's the kind of hope, it's the kind of hope that we have 
as Christians, knowing that one day that I will be with my Jesus forever, in relationship with him, where there is no sin and where there is no brokenness. It's the kind of hope that spurs us on to live in the midst of this world when this world brings misunderstanding, sufferings, and even hardships as that divide grows wider and wider. That's what this letter is all about, understanding the hope that we have while living in this culture. Now, with all of that said, if you've been here the last few weeks, and you know that we have been, over the last three or four weeks, that you know that we have been in one of the most challenging parts of probably all of Scripture, but specifically of 1 Peter. That it is a challenging space. That four weeks ago, we began this journey, starting in 2 Peter, all the way back in 2 Peter, 11, uh, 2 Peter uh, verses 11 and 12, where Peter tells us and starts to command us in a certain way in which we are to live. And as we've looked over this, these last couple of weeks, that we have realized how countercultural this reality is. How countercultural it is for the way that Peter's speaking for us to live in light of the way that culture tells us to live. Those verses I want to read to you today. And so if you have your Bibles, 1 Peter chapter 2, just flip there real quick. That this section that we're looking at today, specifically in our verse, begins in 1 Peter chapter 2, starting in verse 11. Here's what he says Beloved Christians, believers, that's what that means. I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the uh, passions of the flesh, which wage war against your soul. Keep your conduct among Gentiles honorable, so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. That when we read those words that Peter writes to us and we hear those, it sounds a lot like what I want to be as a believer, doesn't it? That as a believer, I want to abstain from the things that wage war in my soul. That just sounds like a good idea to me to stay away from. That I look at this and I go, man, I want to live honorably. I want to be about good deeds. I want those good deeds to ultimately bring glory to God. That's the way that I want to live my life. And Peter says, good, if you want to live your life that way, here's what it looks like. And starting in verse 13, he says, the way that we, that we live righteously... The way that we, that we use our good deeds, the way that we live honorably and glorify God, the first way is that we are subject to every human institution starting with our government. That we are to be subject to our government, whether they agree with us politically or not. And even at times when they are ruthless, you be subject to your government. And then he takes it a step further and he says, he says starting in verse 18, that you are to be subject, you are to be subject in your occupation, in your jobs, in your vocations, even when those who have authority over you in those those roles are unjust. And then he takes it a step further and he begins to to apply this this idea of of submissiveness, of submissiveness to, to marriages. And he basically says this, that the way that Christians are to live out their marriage has huge impact, huge impact on the way that others see and view and are able to experience the glory of God. And so if you were here last week, then then you know that Pastor Tim uh, took on some of the most complicated, undoubtedly some of the most difficult verses in all of Scripture in 1 Peter chapter 3, uh, verses 1 through 6. That he spoke to you ladies, specifically you wives, in your role of submissiveness to your husbands. Now, just to like set the rumor mill straight, Pastor Tim did not draw the short straw. He actually volunteered for that. Okay, God bless his soul. All right. And if you were here last week, then you know that he did an exceptional job of explaining what those difficult verses mean. And if you missed that the last week, I would highly encourage you to go back and to listen to that. Because what last week did is it sets up for us the verse that we're looking at today. This little verse in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 7. And so last week, ladies, you were on the hot seat. And so my encouragement to you this week is just to sit back and relax, all right? Because it's the guy's turn, specifically husbands, it's your turn on the hot seat. And this one verse that we're looking at today in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 7, is for me as a man, a husband, a believer, the most scariest verse in all of Scripture. So with that said, as the backdrop, let's read it together. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 7. Likewise, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way, 
showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel, since they are heirs with you of the grace of life, so that your prayers may not be hindered. Whenever culture critiques biblical gender roles and specifically Christian marriages, the thing that comes to the forefront every time, every single time in their critique, the thing that comes to the forefront is the picture of the domineering man. The man who leads with an iron fist and his submissive wife is behind him carrying her ball and chain or on a leash or whatever that picture looks like. And sadly, way too often, Christian men have failed to properly understand their role within marriage And instead of bringing glory to God, have simply validated cultural critique of passages such as this one and passages that we find such as in Ephesians chapter 5 and in other places around the New Testament. When I first arrived here at Crossroads Church, uh, I was put in charge of the marriage ministry. And so 11 years ago, I did the marriage ministry. It was a blast. We had such a fun time. Uh, what I didn't realize that when I became kind of the, the head of the marriage ministry is that whatever ministry you run, you become like the resident expert of that. At least that's how people view you, all right? And so very early on in my ministry, I was doing a lot of marriage counseling, like a lot of marriage counseling, and helping couples work through their issues and their, and their problems and all the rest. And early on, there was a guy who would come see me every few months. He would come, and he would make an appointment, and he would come and see me, and every time it would go pretty much the same way, that he would come in, and I would ask him, what, could I, you know, what can I help you with today? And he would always come by himself. He would never come with his wife. And he would say, well, my, Pastor, I just need help because my wife, she's just not being as submissive as she ought to be. And I'd say, all right, well, tell me what that looks like. And so he'd have a whole list, a whole litany of things of, of the way that his wife wasn't submitting the way that she ought to submit. And when he would get done, I'd just look at him and I'd say, man, I, I realize, man, that's, that's probably a difficult, difficult way to live. The way that you're describing, I can, I can see how that would be difficult. But here's the deal, you're, you didn't bring your wife. And it's really hard to address an issue when that issue is not in the room. So we're not, we're not going to talk about that. We're going to talk about how you're doing. How are you doing within your role in marriage? How are you doing in being submissive to your wife? And that question every single time would irritate him. It would annoy him. And he would start huffing and puffing and he would start preaching to me. He would start like, like fire and brimstone preaching. He would say, Pastor, it is not the man's job to submit to the wife. It is her job to submit to me. And if you were a good pastor, you would go and confront my wife and bring her in line with biblical teachings. And he would leave angry. And then three months he would make an appointment and we would do it all again. Now, I tell you that story, I tell you that story, because when it comes, when it comes to marriages and what Peter is is speaking about here, that I want to point you to a specific word that Peter uses right at the beginning of the verse. That he begins this verse in verse 7 with a very specific word. Do you see what the word is? What is it? Likewise, good, likewise. That word likewise can be translated in the same way. In the same way. Well, what Peter was saying, what is, what's, what's in the same way? Well, going all the way back to 2 Peter verses 11 and 12, he says, look, this is how we should live. That we should be subject to the governing authorities. In the same way, you should be subject in your vocation. In the same way, wives, be subject to your husbands. Likewise, in the same way, husbands, be subject, be submissive to your wives. In the biblical context throughout the New Testament, there is no room for domineering men. But rather what is taught throughout the New Testament is this idea of mutual submission. Husbands are to be subject, to be submissive to their wives. Which leads us to a question as husbands, well what does that look like? And Peter says that the way that you are to be submissive, likewise, verse 7, husbands live with your wives in an understanding way. That the way that we are to be submissive to our wives is to be living in an understanding way. Which, as we look at that, interestingly enough, that phrase in the Greek is very hard to to translate. And so the English translators kind of help us guys out a little bit in our understanding. Because very literally, that phrase, understanding 
living in an understanding way, literally means this, all right? Get ready. Dwelling in the knowledge of the female. (laughs) How awesome is that, right, guys? That Peter says, Peter says, look, look, look. The way to submit to your wife is to understand women. And every guy here goes, good luck, right? Right? We've been trying to do that for centuries. There's not a chance that that's going to happen. What else do you got, Peter? And I think when Peter wrote this, he froze for a moment and he goes, I got to give him more. I got to give him something else. Because Peter's no fool, right? He's not writing this in a vacuum. Peter's married. Peter is a married guy. He knows the struggles, the hardships, the tensions, the misunderstandings that come in marriage. He knows that he's got to give guys more than what he's initially said. And he says, guys, I want you to live in an understanding way, specifically with your wife. And here's what I want you to know. Here's what I want you to do. Point number two in your outline. To live with your wives in an understanding way means to be submissive to my wife means that I'm going to honor her. That be submissive to my wife in an understanding way means that I'm going to honor her. You want to be a man who lives in good deeds, who's righteous, who who brings about the glory of God in this life? Then Peter looks out at you and he says, you honor the women in your life. Specifically, you honor your wife. That word honor means to hold in high regard, to esteem with value and with worth. It means, it means that husbands, you honor your wives. And very specifically, he says, you honor your wife in two ways. The first way that he gives us, look at the text. He says, the first way that we're to honor our wives is as the weaker vessel. Now, throughout church history, this little verse has been used in a variety of ways that quite honestly has, been, has brought great destruction to marriages and specifically that of women. What Peter is not saying, please hear this, what Peter is not saying is that women are, are weaker in the mind. You can't get that from here. What Peter is not saying, he is not saying that women are somehow weaker spiritually. That's not what's going on. He's not saying that women, because they tend to acknowledge their feelings better than men, are somehow inferior. That's not what's going on here. The word vessel that Peter uses throughout the New Testament is simply used to describe bodies. That our bodies are our vessels. And what Peter is saying is that we are to honor our wives, that we are to honor women because they are weaker physically. And generally speaking, we all know that, don't we? We don't have to look very much further than sports to realize that's true. And in Peter's day, this would have been even more apparent as as most of the work, as most of the vocational work was manual labor in an agricultural world. And yet what Peter's getting at here is not just simply comparing the size of muscles and and how that brings honor, but he's getting at something bigger than that. In Peter's day, it was commonly assumed that because women were weaker physically, that it meant that they were also less dignified. That they were not worthy of honor. In fact, because of this this common cultural mindset, it was common for women to be taken advantage of and simply seen as objects of gratification for men. And Peter steps in here and he goes, boys, we're not going to play that game. We're not going to go down that road. We're not going to objectify women. We're not going to do that. We're going to honor our wives. Very specifically, she is the weaker vessel. You protect her from being objectified. Which in the greater context of chapter 3 makes perfect sense, doesn't it? I mean, just remember back to last week when we were talking to the ladies. And in verses 3 through 5 of 1 Peter chapter 3, Peter basically says this to you women. He says, don't let your external beauty define who you are. Don't go down that road. Don't let your external beauty define your identity. Instead, work at cultivating your inner beauty in such a way that it is precious to the Lord. And now as he turns his his attention to husbands, he looks at it and says, your role is to help your wife in that. That's where you step in. That's where you help. And so husbands, as we think about this and as we look at this and as we try to put it in the context of our world, what does that look like for us? Does it mean 
that we are to veil our wives so that their external beauty is not seen in this world, like is practiced in other parts of the world? No. It means that you are to honor her by creating and protecting an environment where she can thrive in the cultivation of her inner beauty where you are leading your wife time and time again in a way that love, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, goodness, faithfulness, and self-control can thrive, flourish in her life. Now, admittedly, this is easy to say and hard to do, isn't it? And that many husbands, myself included, fall woefully short in this area of our marriage. And ladies, please hear me when I say this. That when us husbands fall short of this, the reason for it is not because we don't think it's important. We know it's important. It's not because we don't care. We care deeply. In most cases, it's simply because we don't know how. And we realize how important this is and we don't want to mess it up and we don't want to fail and so we just don't. And we let passivity drive us. But guys, hear this. We cannot let passivity drive us. This word honor here is not a passive verb. It is not sitting back and waiting. It is actively engaged. And I'm telling you, men, that our wives need to be honored. They need to know what it looks like to have honor brought upon them, for them to be held in high regard in this culture, for boys that you are a role model for, that it's important for them to understand that as real men of faith, that we reject passivity and we actively engage into this world and we actively engage with the women in our lives by honoring them and for the little girls in our life, our daughters, It is so important that they understand what it looks like to have a man who honors them in a culture that is constantly trying to objectify them because of the beauty that they hold. That we as men cannot sit back and be passive in this moment. We have to dwell in the knowledge of the female. And the best advice that I can give you today is as a husband, is during your lunch with your wife today is to ask this simple question. This is point 2A. How can I create an environment? How can I create an environment in our home that helps you cultivate your inner beauty? That every single husband here today, at lunch today, needs to ask their wife this question. How can I create an environment in our home that will help you cultivate your inner beauty? And the good news for you guys is this is that you don't have to dwell in the knowledge of my female, right? That's my issue. You get to dwell in the knowledge of your female. You get to to dwell in the knowledge of, of your wife. Be a learner. Ask the questions. Honor her as the weaker vessel. Paul says that's the first way that we honor women. The second way he comes into, look at what it says. Peter says that I'm to honor my wife as an heir of the grace of life. Do you see that there? that I am to honor my wife as, as, as an heir of the grace of life. So how do we understand that? Well, Peter's already helped us understand that to a degree in, first, in his first chapter. So just turn back a page to 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. Let me read these for you. It says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy... He has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. To an inheritance, there it is, that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you. Now hear what Peter's saying here. He's talking to believers, and he says this inheritance comes about because our wives and us as husbands, by the great mercy of God, that which we did not deserve, were brought into life, that we were born again. And as we look throughout the New Testament at this idea of being born again, what we see is that time and time again, being born again means that also that now we are a child of God. 
And as a child of God, you are given an inheritance by your heavenly Father, that you get everything that he owns, which in the scope of the context of your heavenly Father being God is breathtakingly broad, isn't it? It means like everything in the universe. We are heirs. Now more specifically, more specifically, the woman to whom you are married The woman to whom you are married, if she is a believer, then she is an heir to everything in this universe. That's how honorable she is. That's how worthy she is. That's how magnificent she is. In every sense of the word, she is a princess of the Most High King. Don't let that slide by too fast. In these last two weeks, if you've been with us, scenes are, where Peter is pointing us in our marriage and how culture tells us to live in our marriage, that undoubtedly during this span of these two weeks that you have felt the tension of trying to navigate this. You have felt the uncomfortableness of it. And as you have felt the uncomfortableness of that, when you have felt that, you have felt only a, this is still the reality. Nine years ago, I had the opportunity to go to Israel with Pastor Kim, and just as kind of a short sidebar, if you've never been to Israel, you should consider going. It absolutely changed the way that I read the scriptures and the way that I see God. But nine years ago, I was on a trip to Israel, and on that trip to Israel, Pastor Kim also brought two of his daughters, Ashley and Lindsay. Now, you need to know that for 27 years, I have known the Skadam family. That when we were all kids, we kind of grew up together. The the Scadams were at my house all the time. And we played together. And they are much more than friends to me. They are are legitimately family. As their brother, you get some good things from me, right? If you were a brother of mine, or if I'm your brother, then you get my fierce loyalty. And I'm telling you, there is not a mountain or a hill too small that I'm not willing to fight for, right? I mean, like, you just get that. But also, like, if you're a sibling... And I didn't know what he was asking, and I, and I said, well, I, I don't know what you mean. What, what do you mean? He goes, is this woman yours to give? She's very beautiful, and I'd like her hand in marriage. <laughs> and then once we got to that point, I called the deal off, and I said, man, I'm just kidding. She's not mine to give away. And we got on the bus, and later I found out from our tour guide that that was probably the most socially uh, or culturally insensitive thing that I could do. And there's probably a or something, you know. Uh, that's, that's, what, that's what, how it would happen. But that event cemented in my life that this cultural mindset of Peter's day is not that far off from our reality, is it? It's not that far off from our reality. Husbands, Peter says, you honor your wife that she is the daughter of a king. And I know that for some of you, you're sitting here and you're going, but Matt, what, what about my wife? She's not a believer. What do I do with this? What does that look like for me? That's a good question. If you were here last week, then you saw as we read through the verses that women, through their conduct, through the way that they live, have the opportunity to win their husbands to Christ. And I think the same implication is here because I'm telling you, there is not a woman on this earth who does not want to be honored in the way that Peter is speaking about here. That whether your wife is a believer or not, if you are able to cultivate in your home a place where she can flourish, if you are able to treat her day in, day out as a king's daughter, as a princess, I am telling you, you have the opportunity to bring God's glory into your home through that. And so Peter tells us, husbands, that you're to honor your wife because she's a weaker vessel. Since she is an heir of the grace of life with you. And then he gives us the reason. Look at the reason that he gives us. First Peter, end of verse 7. You do all of this so that, here's the reason, that your marriage might be better. No, that's what we would expect him to say, but that's not what he says, is it? He says, so that your prayers may not be hindered. And it's right here That makes this the scariest verse for me in all of Scripture because Peter explains what he means in verse 12. Skip down. He says, For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears, they're open to their prayers, but the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Peter says, this is point number three, that your relationship with your wife, 
Your relationship with your wife has huge impact on your relationship with your God. No ways around it. So much so that Peter says that if it's not going well here, it's not going well here either. That he links our relationship with our spouse to our relationship with him. And we've all felt this, haven't we? We've all realized this. That when things are not going well with my wife, then it feels like God is distant. I can't tell you how many counseling appointments that I've been in where we're working through an issue and and at a time the husband just looks at me and he says, man, I want to be better. And I cry out to God and I pray and I pray and I pray and it feels like it just falls on deaf ears. That's just not some feeling that we make up in our lives. That is the consequence of sin in our lives as husbands. That God's ears are closed off to us. It doesn't have anything to do with our salvation. This isn't a salvific issue. It just means that the way that you deal with your wife, the way that you deal with your wife, and the way that you choose not to deal with your life in the light of this conduct, means that your sin is hindering your relationship with your Savior. And if you're in that situation right now, the best thing that you can do is to put away your pride and honor your wife. And I know for some of you, you're going to go, but, 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 Matt, you don't know my wife. Right? You don't know what she's done. You don't know how she speaks to me. You don't know what that looks like in our lives. You don't know how impossible that is. And you're right, I don't. But what I do know is that Peter doesn't make this an if-then statement. If your wives are submissive to you, then you be submissive to them. That's not there. What Peter says you want to be a righteous husband in Christ you want to know what that looks like it's a man whose conduct is honorable who treats his wife honorably as the weaker vessel who treats her as an heir to the grace of life in which he also shares and when you do that God's face is upon you and he hears your prayers and if you choose to be selfish and not honorable with your wife, then God's face is against you. And I'm telling you, that is a scary place to live because I know my own propensity to sin. I know how dark my heart can be. I know in my anger, I'm not honorable. I know that in, when my pride gets in the way, that I'm not very honorable. I know that at times I am so driven in this life that I'm not very honorable. I know my propensity for sin and how dark my soul can be. And when I realize that, this verse is scary. It's been so convicting to me this week that every day I've just woken up and I've just prayed a simple prayer every morning. God, would you give me the wisdom, the courage, and the strength to get beyond my pride and to honor your daughter, my wife, this day. And I think when we do that, God blesses that prayer. And in turn, we become a blessing to the wife that we're called to love. And that's when our marriage becomes the greatest witness for, for the, our marriage becomes its greatest witness in glorifying God in a culture in a culture that questions the validity of not only our God, but the validity of the marriage, the institution that he put in place. So the way that we're going to close service today is we're not going to sing a in our life where we have realized how countercultural these teachings are. And Lord, we have felt the tension in our lives of what culture calls us to be and what you call us to be in our relationships. And Father, as we've looked at these last two weeks, there have been moments for both husbands and wives where we realize that we have fallen woefully short of what you've called us to be in our marriages. And so Lord, before we ask for your blessing, we come to you, and Lord, we ask for your forgiveness. We fall at the cross of Jesus and ask for your grace and your mercy to forgive our sins and you tell us in your words that when we ask for our forgiveness for those times that we have not been honorable for those times that we have focused on our outer beauty 
light of that forgiveness, Lord, that you would bless the marriages of Crossroads Church. God, that you would help us live according to your word. Lord, that the husbands in this space, in this room right now, Lord, would boldly put on this role of honoring their wives. Lord, that they would honor them, protecting them, creating a house in which their wives can flourish, realizing that every day that they wake up next to your daughter. God, I pray for the women in this room. Lord, who are constantly bombarded with what identity is and, and what it looks like to be a spouse. Lord, it's so countercultural to the way that you call us to live. God, I pray that in their pure conduct, as they cultivate the inner beauty of their lives, Lord, that that would be a great testimony to the glory of you in their lives. And Lord, that as we live in those ways, that our marriages would ultimately point people to you time and time again, that it would be our greatest witness to this world. God, would you bless the marriages in that way? God, I pray for those in this room where divorce is a part of their story. God, I pray that 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 would not identify them. Lord, that that would not become their identity, but Lord, that that is just a part of their story and that they too would fall with grace and mercy at your cross and ask for your forgiveness and that in their story it is not the burdensome of divorce that reigns, but Lord, it is your grace and through that grace, Lord, that they realize that their story is not yet done, that you have bigger things in store. And God, I pray for those in this room who are single. God, for the women here, Lord, that you would help them continue to cultivate that inner beauty that is precious to your sight. That they would reject culture's definition of who they are supposed to be and and the way that they are look and the way that they use their body to attract men. But Lord, that you would cultivate those fruits of the Spirit that are so precious in your sight. And God, I pray for the single men in this room in a culture that cultivates that women are conquests, that we would do better, that men here would do better. And Lord, that we would rise up and that we would practice honoring the women in our lives every single day, from old to young. And Lord, that we would show this world a new picture of what it looks like to be in relationship with each other and relationship with you. Father, at the end of the day, Lord, we ask all of this because we want to be in right relationship with you. We want our prayers to be heard. We want to walk with you. Lord, we want to experience the hope that we have now in our lives, the great joy that brings it, no matter what happens in this world, that we can face it with joy because you are there with us. God, that's what we want. And so, Lord, I pray that you would bless the people of Crossroads Church in this reality as you point us into the world to serve people toward and connect people to you. It's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen. If you're not standing, yeah, yeah. Everyone, you can stand. As a way of closing, just two quick things for you. If you uh, want to help in your marriage, a devotion in your marriage. Our marriage team has provided a devotional. You can pick it up at the Welcome Center on your way out. If you need prayer, we would love to pray with you down here. Pastor James will be here. Some others uh, will be down here to pray for you. I'm going to scoot out really quick because I have to make it to Fort Lupton in the snow, all right? So uh, you can't pray with me, but you can pray with Corey, all right? So with that said, will you receive this blessing today? May the Lord bless you and may the Lord keep you. And may the Lord's face shine upon you. And may he be gracious to you. And may the Lord lift his countenance, his smile upon you today. And may that give you peace. And all of God's people said, amen. Amen. Thanks for being here today. Enjoy your day.